So we were discussing manifold suboptimization method in the previous class. So we'll continue the discussion from where we left. Uh, I'm going to write down all the expressions that we I I had written on the board. So you don't have to copy it. Uh, So I want to minimize f of x, ax less than equal to b, x is in Rn. So I define ak as aj, j is in the set of active constraints at ak. I define bk accordingly. I solve this minimization problem and this solution is given by mu equals to minus hk inverse oh this is dk sorry HK inverse. Okay, all of this looks correct. So we have two, we have three options. Option one is dk is not equal to zero. Then you get xk plus one equals xk plus alpha k dk, where alpha k is supposed to be some feasible value between zero and its maximum possible value. Uh, second case is 2a dk is equal to 0 and there exists a j bar such that mu j bar is less than 0. Then we drop j bar from a x k and compute d bar k by solving the same problem except for the fact that now your AK will not comprise of this constraint J bar. And then B is DK equals to zero. And mu J is non-negative for all J in AXK, in which case uh, XK is stationary. So this is roughly where we, uh, where we stopped in the previous class. So today we are going to look at the assertion 2 and assertion 2a and 2b, what exactly is happening. Okay. Perfect. So my dk is equal to 0. So this is a positive definite matrix. This is a negative sign. So which means that this particular term is 0. So I have my gradient of fxk equals minus 
mu j a j where j is in a x k. This is the case too. Oh, I need to draw the diagram as well. <coughs> so I'm standing at this point. This is my xk. And I have three active constraints. This line, this line, and this line. So I have three active constraints here. And uh, and therefore, my feasible direction d is 0, uh, dk is 0 at this particular point. And we need to drop one of the constraints. So let's look at the part b. So what happens? So what are the feasible directions at this particular point? Uh, so I know that a k x k plus alpha d so at this point a k x k equals to b k which means that any feasible direction direction D must satisfy a k D is less than equal to 0. Or I should say a j transpose D for all j in a x k. So in this particular point, so I'm standing at xk here. I can go in this direction. I can go in this direction. I can go here. I can go here. I can go here. All of these are potential feasible directions. And by the way, when I'm drawing these arrows, I can also go inside the set. Because feasible directions means all the possible points I can jump to, standing at xk. OK, so I'm not just restricting myself to only the active constraints. I'm really looking at the entire set. And no matter where I want to go, this particular condition must be satisfied. Because you have, uh, you have the point. The point actually satisfies the fact with equality here. So for every active constraint, AJ transpose D must be less than equal to 0. Otherwise, if this, is, if this condition is violated for any one of the J, then in that case, if I take a small step, I'll go outside the set because I'm already standing at the boundary. Does that make sense? Does everyone agree with this particular statement? So I'm standing at xk. I want to go to any of the points within the set. Okay? And if I pick any of this direction d, it must satisfy this with with, for all, but all constraints j that are active at xk. Uh, so, to see why this should be the case, so this implies aj transpose xk equals to bj for all j in axk. Now, if my aj transpose d is positive, let's say aj bar, no, j bar is already used. Uh, what should I pick? AK. Are we using K? Oh, K is already used. L. L is used somewhere? No, L is not used. For some L in AXK, then AJ transpose XK plus alpha 
d is greater than b j. A L transpose, sorry. Do all of you agree with this statement? Okay. So, no questions? Perfect. So, we all agree on this particular statement. Now, let us look at the case 2b. So, mu j is non negative, and I have this equation. Let me call this equation 1, and this part is equation 2. So, I have gradient f x k transpose d equals to minus summation so a j transpose d is so this term is non negative uh, non positive from equation 3. Mu j is non negative from equation 2. So, what is the sign of this gradient of f x k transpose d? So, this is greater than equal to 0. So, this is negative, this is positive, and I have a negative sign here. So, this whole summation is going to be positive. What is the definition of, at what point is gradient of f x k transpose d non-negative uh, non when x k is stationary? It satisfies necessary condition for optimality. Okay. Any question? So I'm roaming around on the surface of the set, okay, and I reach a point where my dk is zero, and I found, I looked at the sign of each of the elements of this vector mu, and it turns out that all of the elements are non-negative. So it's 0 0.1, 10 raised to minus 6, whatever all of those are non negative what if what if one of the term is 10 raised to minus 10 raised to minus 6 is that negative or positive or non negative technically negative it's really small it's very small it must be a numerical error of some sort so you are pretty much standing at the optimal point pretty much maybe the optimal point is just a little bit here and there but you are kind of sort of at the optimal point. So, you look at the, so you check each of these mu, the values of mu and if it is, if all of them are positive, you are in good shape. If one of them turns out to be minus 10 raised to minus 6, you are kind of sort of okay. If it turns out to be minus 0 0.1, then you need to take a step, okay. So, just make sure whenever I write so this is something you will learn in optimization, especially if you are writing solvers. Whenever I write something is non-negative, in MATLAB, what you have to check is if it is, you don't have to check the absolute sign of it. You will have to probably add 10 raised to minus 6, 10 raised to minus 5, and then try to check what the sign of it is, because you don't want to add any, you don't want to keep uh, iterating over the loop because of some numerical errors that might be happening in the computation. Uh, you might have also seen it when you are solving assignment 2 I, and I have seen many solutions now. So, whenever you look at gradient of f x k or f x star, some people are getting it minus 10 raised to minus 15. 
right? And that's pretty much optimal solution. So just be careful when you are writing solvers. Okay, zero, zero doesn't mean zero in MATLAB. <laughs> well, 10 raised to minus 15 also means zero in MATLAB. So anyways, that's uh, something to uh, remember. But, uh, but what we have here is that if dk equals to zero and each of the mu j is non-negative for all active constraint, then xk is stationary. That's what we have proven. So you are at a candidate optimal solution. To prove that you are at the optimal solution, either f has to be convex or you have to figure out some other way of proving that you are at the optimal solution. Okay, so now I want to move to 2a. Okay. No questions on 2b, so I'll erase much of the stuff. I don't know what all things I need to keep. How do you decide on an applicable numerical precision? Like it's all very case to case dependent. And it's also dependent not just on case to case, but also on the execution time you need. So okay. uh, going from 10 raised to minus 6 to 10 raised to minus 15 might take 500 iterations or might not take those many iterations. So a lot of it is on a case to case basis. So to give you an example, say you are at Walmart Labs and you're optimizing the supply chain of the entire Walmart's movement of goods and services and all that stuff. In that case, even if you are within like, if gradient of F is five or six, you're still good because it's close to zero. Because those, those functions are so complex and so large that you're never, gonna you're never going to go to zero. Gradient of f will never go to zero. But so the thing is that a lot of this knowledge you will get imparted when you join on the second day and third day. Somebody will tell you that, okay, gradient of fx is five, you are doing very good. <laughs> Even though in optimization you learn that the gradient has to be zero, but when you're solving those complicated problems, it need not be zero. Okay, so when dk equals to zero and I pick a j, j bar such that mu j bar is less than zero and then I drop j bar from axk and compute d bar k. So I'm solving this particular problem all over again. So I get d bar k. I have to maybe define a bar k. So I pick all the active constraints except for j bar and I, I stack them up aj transpose sorry this should be transpose am I missing transpose here too make a note here there is a transpose here in this matrix and there should be a transpose here as well okay so what is my d bar k going to be So I need to prove the following. I need to prove two statements or I need to uh, ensure two statements. Statement one is d bar k is not equal to zero. And statement two is gradient f x k transpose d bar k is less than zero.
what should we do to prove that d bar k is not equal to zero? So let's assume, let's assume for the sake of argument that d bar k is equal to zero. So if d bar k equals to zero, then it means that gradient of fx k equals to negative So I have equation one here. I'm going to call it equation two. Okay. So equation equation one says, maybe I should remove this two from here to avoid confusion. So equation one says the gradient of fx k satisfies this equation. Equation two says gradient of fx k satisfies this expression. And I'm going to lead I'm going to lead this argument to a contradiction. So that would imply that our hypothesis that d bar k equals to zero is incorrect. This is my equation two. I'm going to subtract this. What do I get? Zero equals to minus mu j bar a j bar plus summation mu bar j minus mu j a j. This is j not equal to j bar. So I subtracted equation two from equation one, and I get this expression, which is similar to saying mu j bar a j bar equals to some summation of a j, j equal to not, j not equal to j bar. Is there a problem in this equation? What's wrong in this equation? You get nothing with j bar on the right hand side. Sorry? You get nothing with j bar on the right hand side. Right, so there's nothing on, uh, with j bar on the right hand side and then j bar only appears on this side. And remember that mu j bar was a non-zero non -zero vector, a uh, non-zero element. It was strictly negative. And so these could be zero, this could be non-zero. But on this side, this is non-zero, this is non-zero. Okay, so this side is non-zero. This side, if these two are equal, then this becomes equal to zero. If these two are unequal, then what I have is AJ bar is a linear combination of AJs. Do you think that the three lines that you see here, three active constraints you see here, they are linearly dependent on each other. They're not linearly dependent on each other because they're all going in different direction, right? So if you look at, if you look at the AJ, uh, they all will be pointing in different directions. So they're not linearly dependent on each other. But this equation seems to suggest that AJ bar is a linear combination of AJ, which contradicts the fact that these are all independent directions as a result of which our hypothesis that d bar k equals to zero is wrong. Okay, because we started with this hypothesis and we concluded that there is like a linear dependent structure at this particular point and that cannot happen because these are all independent constraints. So our hypothesis must be wrong. So d bar k must be non-zero. So that proves the first statement that uh, if I drop this constraint j bar with mu j bar strictly negative, then I'm going to get a non-zero vector. So this vector is not equal to zero. 
Now the second part is this particular statement. So any question so far? No? Mu bar is uh, this particular mu with a k replaced with a bar k, all of these places. Okay. And mu is just a way of conceptualizing the active constraints. Sorry. Mu is just the active constraints, or uh, mu is not the active constraint. Uh, we will in three or four classes later we'll talk about Lagrange multipliers. So mu is actually a Lagrange multiplier. We have not talked about it yet, but okay. that's what it'll turn out to be. Uh, yeah, anyways, like, when we talk about Lagrange multipliers, we'll talk about what mu, what information mu contains. It contains a very, very important information. Uh, but we will not talk about it until five or six classes later. Any other question? Okay. Now I need to prove this equation too. So I want to erase this side of the board. So I have So I'm minimizing this particular objective function uh, and I'm minimizing it with a k d equals to zero. Is d equals to zero a feasible solution to this problem? Right, so d equals to zero satisfies the constraint. It is also an Rn. So in other words, d equals to zero is a feasible solution, not solution, sorry, I don't want to say solution d equals to zero is a feasible point within this optimization problem. So this means that this is less than or equal to gradient fxk transpose zero plus half zero transpose hk zero. This is the optimal solution. This is the value of the objective function at a specific point. And by virtue of this being an optimal solution, you must be have you you must have a less than equal to sign here. And this term is actually zero. So what I have is gradient of f x k transpose d bar k is less than equal to minus half d bar k transpose h k d bar k and this is strictly less than zero. Okay, that's the complete algorithm for solving problems of this type. What we have shown is, in the previous class, we have shown that if dk is not equal to zero, I can always descend in that particular direction by picking an appropriate value of alpha k. In case dk turned out to be zero, and if there exists a j bar such that mu j bar is less than zero, then I'm going to drop it from the constraint set and I'm going to compute d bar k. 
what we have just shown is in this situation, d bar k will always be non-zero, and d bar k will always be a valid descent direction. Okay, so we have shown both these results. In case d k is equal to zero, and mu j is non-negative for all j, then we have shown that x k is stationary point, which means it's a candidate for an optimal solution. So that's uh, what manifold suboptimization method is. In the context of linear programming, I'll just make a small comment here. If fx is equal to c transpose x, this is a linear programming problem, then it is known as a simplex method. This algorithm is known as a simplex method. And this was designed in, I don't know, 1940s, when everyone was shooting at each other. Uh, and in that algorithm, the only difference is you pick alpha k in a very specific fashion. So in simplex method, you start with some initial point like this. And then you, you move. So if, once you figure out that at this point, this is the feasible direction, you directly jump to this particular point. OK? You don't, you don't pick alpha k. You don't pick alpha k specifically. What, what happens, or the, rather I should say, the way you pick alpha k is such that you go from this point directly to this point. And at this point, if this is your descent direction, you go from this point directly to this point. And the only difference in the case of nonlinear function is that you pick an alpha k a bit more judiciously so as to not move from this point directly to this point. OK, so in linear programming for some reason, um, you basically move from one point directly to the next, next vertex. So from this vertex, you directly move to this vertex. From this vertex, you directly move to this vertex. Whereas in the case of nonlinear uh, non functions, you don't try to go from one vertex to another. You try to take a few steps in between, because you don't know what's going to happen in the middle. So that's the only difference. And, and uh, this, this algorithm was, uh, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's one of the first algorithms to solve this linear programming problem of uh, minimizing c transpose x such that ax is less than or equal to b. And again, if I'm not mistaken, this method was used for moving troops and moving supplies during the World War II. OK? What prevents you from overshooting the vertex? Uh, you know what they do generally is uh, they will uh, they define what is known as an edge that is moving out and edge that is coming in. I don't know how they define it. It's a very complicated way of writing it out, but. Uh, at this point, when you reach at this point, you know that you need to remove one of the constraint, one of the active constraint. But what they do is they add another active constraint, and then they just invert the matrix in order to get to this particular point. So if you look at it in this three-dimensional case, you have ak, xk equals to bk, right? And remember that this AK is a 3 cross 3 matrix. This is an n cross n matrix. And this is n cross 1 matrix. And this one is actually an invertible matrix because these are all independent constraints here. So you can write XK equals to AK inverse BK. So this XK is AK inverse BK. And once you know which constraint you need to remove, you try to figure out which constraints you need to add so as to get to this particular point. So how to figure out which constraint you need to add is something that you will find it described in some book that talks about simplex method. Okay. But that's roughly how they figure out that this constraint this uh, this constraint needs to remove, needs to be removed, and the new constraint needs to be added. And then they compute xk plus one equals to ak plus 1 inverse bk plus 1. And that's how they go from this point directly to this point. So they're deleting the uh, constraints of the upper, 
propane and they add that that's right on. that's right yeah this okay three dimensional problem or seven dimensional problem this one it's a three dimensional problem here you have seven constraints so this a the number of rows of a is seven in this case okay but at any point of time you cannot have more than three active constraints so at every point you have only one active constraint here you have two active constraint here you have three active constraint so no matter where you go you will have at most three active constraints you won't have more than three active constraints okay uh, now let's try to find out another way of solving this linear programming problem i want to minimize c transpose x such that uh, I'll change the constraint a little bit. So let's move on to the next topic, which is an affine scaling method. Yeah, affine scaling method for linear programming. It's a completely different algorithm with a different philosophy. So let's talk a little bit about the philosophy of affine scaling method. I want to minimize C transpose X, AX equals to B, X greater than equal to zero. And I'm talking about this method is from 1960s, somewhere in 1960s. Yeah. How those numbers? Like, can you show an example of a seven cross three matrix which would mean eight eight? Just to see like how those numbers would form those numbers. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Let me let's look at two-dimensional system with four constraints. So this is my x1, this is my x2, and this is my constraint set. So what's the constraint set? x1 greater than equal to 0, x2 greater than equal to 0, x1 less than equal to 1, x2 less than equal to 1, this is 1, 0, this is 0, 1. Okay, so I have these four constraints. Uh, I am going to write it as 0, 0, 1, 1. Uh, okay, so x1 is greater than or equal to 0, so I have minus 1, 0. Then x2 is greater than or equal to 0, so I have 0 minus 1. And then I have 1, 0, and then I have 0, 1. So I have four, four rows here. I have two columns. And this is, of course, R2. And this is in R4. Does this make sense? Okay. Now you want you might want to add additional constraint. So you're going to cut this off and you're going to add this constraint, which could be like A1, A2, X1, X2 less than or equal to B. So as to be in this particular region. Then you can add additional constraint here. Mm -hmm. 
a1 a2 and then b right so in this case you will always each of these points will only have two rows this point will have two rows this point will have two rows okay so those are the active constraints at the origin at the origin when x1 and x2 equals to 0 these are the active constraints so this would be my ak if if i'm at the origin okay this is my xk then this is my ak you will never have four constraints active so if i'm standing at the origin i only have x1 equals to 0 and x2 equals to 0 so only these two constraints are active these three constraints are inactive okay so that's how you figure out what the active constraints are again uh, in matlab the way you you find out the active constraint is not by setting things to be equal to 0 but by checking if ak x minus bk is less than 10 raised to minus 15 python. yeah yeah matlab python <laughs> in any programming language because the problem is that on blackboard you understand what zero means but in matlab they actually take it too literal li too too much literally and that creates problem for optimization okay Yeah, you, you will figure it out. As you get more and more experience in optimization, you will figure it out what roughly is uh, the order. So when you're training, for instance, LLMs, I'm 100% sure that the gradient of the function at the end of the training period would be of the order of 10 raised to 10 or 15 because there are a billion parameters there. So it's nowhere close to zero. but it's as good as zero for that particular application. Any other question on this? Okay. So now I have this problem. I want to minimize C transpose X such that AX equals to B and X is greater than or equal to zero. So I want to show you what it looks like in the 3D space. So here is my X is in R3. What is AX equal to B? So AX equal to B is a hyperplane. Okay, it, it's a plane that extends all the way to infinity. But I have this additional constraint that X must be non-negative. So I have to cut the plane in a way that X is always non-negative. So it'll appear something like this. because x is, x is greater than or equal to 0 at this plane. By the way, why did we need optimization in 60s? What was happening in 60s? Cold War. Yeah, but, but what specifically in Cold War was happening that required a lot of optimization? Sorry? No, you don't need optimization for that. The space race. So space race was the next big thing. And so 1950s onwards, a lot of optimization development happened because of the space race, because they wanted to land man on the moon. <laughs> so it required really a lot of optimization, because if you, uh, if you don't do optimization, the rocket will just not be able to fly, because the amount of fuel requirement for an unoptimized trajectory will be very high. So you needed to figure out exactly what is the right amount of fuel that can take the people to moon and then get them back on the earth, hopefully safely. <laughs> so uh, 
So that's why they needed a lot of optimization tools. And uh, optimization was a very, very active area of study in 1950s and 1960s. And it's still an active area of research because of machine learning and AI. But at that point of time, it was an active area of research because of the uh, moon landing. And by the way, the people in Russia were also studying optimization, and people in US were also studying optimization. Simplex was Russian. Sorry? Simplex. Oh, so Simplex was uh, United States, 1940s. Okay, so they were focusing on research and Manhattan Project and all that stuff. And then in 50s, uh, Russian mathematicians were studying optimization to put Sputnik in the space. And US mathematicians were studying optimization because of the land, moon landing mission, and, and also the space race, and the rocket optimization and all that stuff. And then in 70s, I think people were just improving all the methods that were designed in 50s and 60s. So for instance, this is an improvement over the simplex algorithm that we talked about, but with a different philosophy. So in simplex algorithm, if you were to apply simplex algorithm on this, you will move from one vertex like this, unless you have to go inside the set at some point of time because you don't have any other feasible directions to go to. So that would be, uh, that would be the, the manifold suboptimization method. But now in the affine scaling method, the idea is that I'm not going to go on the side uh, of this particular polygon, I'm just going to be within the set itself. So I'll go from here to here, and then here, and then here. So I'll move along the, uh, I'll get to the optimal point by inside the set. So X star is my optimal point. So I'll get to the optimal point by being inside the set at all points of time. So what is the constraint inside the set? So inside the set, my X is strictly positive. My X is never equal to zero. Like each element of X is strictly positive. That's why I'm not at the boundary. At the boundary, one of the X will be equal to zero. So here, so this is X1, this is X2, this is X3. So at this boundary, X2 equals to zero. At this boundary, X3 equals to zero. At this boundary, x1 is equal to 0, right? So if I'm inside the set, all my x values are going to be positive. C transpose x is, like, this is just my f of x. So f of x is summation of ci xi, i equals 1 to n. Okay, so you go to Kroger or Whole Foods or Giant Eagle, whatever, ci is the cost of spinach per pound and xi is the number of pounds of spinach you're buying, right? Yeah, so, so you can think of this as, this is your nutritional requirement, so you need like this much vitamin B12, this much vitamin D, this much vitamin A, B, C and you want to optimize the cost of, I don't know, groceries in order to meet the nutritional constraint, whatever. And, and each of the vitamins have to be non-negative because you can't have negative vitamins. <laughs> now, grocery shopping will never be the same for you. <laughs> okay. Uh, so this is what we want to minimize. Uh, this is actually typically used for these kind of problem statements. So linear programming is basically used for that. You have to move something from one city to another city. So that's roughly what the cost of uh, one truck is. And then XI is the number of trucks you need to move, for instance. So that's where linear programming is generally used. OK, so I'm standing at XK. I need to figure out my x bar k so that I can take a dis descent step in that particular direction. So here is how we find out what x bar k is going to look like.
Okay, so this is my uh, this is the way I'm going to find my x bar k. Uh, so s k is a tuning parameter here, so I can pick s k as I want in order to increase the weight of this particular this particular function or to reduce the weight of this particular function. So s k does that trade off. The problem with this optimization problem is I know how to solve the problem like this because we have solved it in the previous. Uh, manifold sub-optimization method as well. But with this constraint, I don't know how to solve this problem. Okay, so let's try to remove this constraint for a bit and see what the solution of this looks like. Okay, just for fun. So for fun, the solution turns out to be Okay, so this is my xk, x bar k, and this is my lambda k. If I remove the constraint xk, x is greater than or equal to zero. And what I also know is that my xk is such that xk is strictly positive. So I know all elements of x, xk is strictly positive. What can I do to make sure that x bar k is also strictly positive? So that way, even if I put the constraint, the solution will not change. What can I do? So I know that this particular, all the elements of this vector is strictly positive. I want to figure out how to make x bar k strictly positive by appropriately picking s k to be small number. I have a strictly positive number. This is something I can pick. I have complete freedom over SK, and this is something that comes from the problem statement itself. So I'll compute this value. I know XK. I'll pick my SK such that X bar K is strictly positive. Then that's also a solution to this problem with the constraint that X is greater than or equal to zero. Okay. And we are out of time, but basically in the next class, I'll talk about how to pick HK in a way that this whole algorithm makes sense and it also converges faster to the optimal solution. So we'll talk about that in the next class. But this is the philosophy of this algorithm. So we have picked SK already, now we just need to pick HK appropriately. That's all, uh, I'll see you guys on Friday. Oh, today is Friday, I'll see you on Monday. <laughs>